Boa noite a todos. Welcome to Tom Plays Europa Universalis 4 for Absolute Beginners. This time we're going with Portugal, which is the uh, third of the countries recommended for new players, and an interesting one. <laughs> I do think Portugal is actually arguably quite hard to play. We will tend to find that we are in danger of running out of money, but let's get to it. So I've got this information about the nation. It's basically telling us that we're going to have a very powerful navy, we're going to be colonising almost entirely, exploring Africa will be part of our mission, and we also need to keep a very close eye on our nobles. Okay. So here's where we start. Our land is the green area. And got a little enclave in North Africa. So this is the, the basic screen. We have a, a number of alerts here. So I usually start by trying to deal with those. Too few rivals. Okay, so click on the alert. You go straight to this screen. This is a part of the shield. Large shield on the top left. Anytime you click that, you come to this main menu system, which has a whole bunch of tabs, most of which we're going to need. But you can also get straight to it by clicking on the alert. Right. So, this concept of rivals, basically the idea is, in order to increase our prestige as a nation, we're pretty much required to declare people who we are competing with, or who are our enemies. So it actually tries to help by giving us a list of who our enemies are, which are all the North African nations. Morocco is a big one for Portugal, we definitely want them. So who have we got? So these are our options. The one we absolutely must never choose, at least not for a very long time, is Castile. There are a few bits of guidance here, so this is their opinion of us. Green in this game is generally good, red is bad, yellow is in the middle. So Castile likes us, these four nations hate us, and all these four nations have a smaller army than us, whereas Castile's is about twice the size, and everyone has a smaller navy than us. So yeah, I would definitely pick Morocco. So it basically tells us what's going to happen. I'm actually wondering if it's worth picking Granada. Granada's this very small nation here, and it's possible we'll get pulled into a war with them by Castile. So even though they don't consider us an enemy, they're probably a good choice just because they're quite small. I'm surprised we can pick them as a rival. So, our other two options. We don't need to have three. You see the alert has now disappeared. But having more rivals, among other things, will increase our power production, which has a bunch of benefits. You can actually see them there. They're all the things in green. So it's generally worth doing if we can get away with it. We do have to be careful as Portugal, because we're not a military nation, really. But nonetheless, right, so Tlemcen is here, and Tunis is here. I think I would go for Tunis, simply because if we're lucky, we might be able to get an alliance with Tlemcen to help us take down Morocco. Even though Tunis is often more powerful. But yeah, it's not that significant. Right. Okay, so the next alert, Provincial Unrest. Which I'm not sure we're going to be able to do much about. So this is this enclave here. We took this relatively recently from Morocco. It's uh, probably our only really vulnerable piece of land. I think the only way we're going to be able to deal with that, to be honest, is to park our army there. We'd, there are a few options, but none of them are very good. 
Oh, except for perhaps send missionary. That might actually be worth doing. Oh no, no it won't. If you actually check, you do need to watch this who's sending missionaries. Missionaries can um, make your country more peaceful. Because if everyone follows the same religion, you're less likely to have revolutions. But in this case, it's warning us that at this speed, it will never be fully converted. So there's no point. Absolutely no point. So this is actually something we're not going to be able to do anything about. Let's alert. Okay, low crown land. Alright. So this takes us to the estate screen. This is going to be particularly important for Portugal. The, the concept of the estate is that there are three powerful groups in our country other than ourselves, other than the actual government. And each of these groups owns a certain portion of the land. Now we get some quite nasty negatives because we don't own 30% of the land. We are so close to owning that. The nobles own most of it, often the case. Uh, the clergy controls quite a lot to be fair and the burghers control relatively little. These are like the merchant class, they become more important as the game goes on. Portugal tends to be a, a pretty devout country so the clergy is quite important. Possibly not quite as extreme as Castile. Okay, so each of his estates has got a loyalty, 50%. And this is actually reducing over time to what they call the equilibrium. I believe to keep them loyal we only need to keep them above 30%. They also have an influence level which we must be careful of. We don't want it to get too high. Now the loyalty has started off much higher than its equilibrium level. So what I would recommend is that we see some land. Because they'll all lose 20 loyalty, but none of them is going to drop below 30. So I think we can do that just this once without any real negatives. So the three options we've got here are to basically sell land, which gives us money, but also means we lose some of this crown land. We can summon the diet, which is kind of like a feudal parliament. This can be well worth doing, but we'll cover that in a bit. And we can seize land, so I'm going to start by doing that. So we don't like it, it's a bit despotic, but it's got rid of our alert. It means we're no longer gain getting negatives for not owning enough crown land. And these will start to improve again over time. So that's that alert dealt with. This alert here is we have a free advisor slot. Now this is one of the areas where we're going to suffer a bit as Portugal. I generally find that Portugal specifically tends to run out of money. It's interesting, it's like you can sort of compare the country to Castile next door which is one of the other suggested nations. Both of these countries are entirely meant to be colonial, I think. But Castile starts off with twice the land, twice the money, twice the power. It also has the Iberian wedding later on where they get Aragon and usually Naples for free. Portugal doesn't have any of that. So we're at a bit of a disadvantage. We're kind of like a poorer Castile. Um, a less militarily powerful Castile and we have to be extremely careful. It's, it's quite interesting that they put this down as recommended for beginners because I do think Portugal is much harder to play than the other two recommended for beginners. The reason I think they have put it down is that Portugal really can just focus on colonizing. So it makes it simpler to play even though it's not easy to play. So yeah, there's quite a few disadvantages to playing Portugal. So what about the advantages? Um, so one of the big advantages we have is our position. So we've got, um, we have an advantage in colonizing and in the navy anyway, but we start off on the extreme southwest of Europe 
We also have a couple of islands, which are well out into the ocean. So this basically means that we can colonize further and faster than anybody else. We also begin the game, I believe, with an explorer, which I don't think anyone else does. So we can start exploring the ocean straight away, which is something we will come to. But the other thing about our position is, apart from this little enclave, which honestly we can afford to lose if we need to, we basically have a border only with one country, which is very unusual, Castile, and said country is friendly to us, which is possibly unique. So in a lot of ways we really can avoid conflict. At the start of the game, there are advantages to trying to attack Morocco, because we're still relatively powerful, still one of the big European nations, but as we focus on colonization, our military power will diminish. So, basically we're going to do our military conquests either at the start or at the end of the game. And it's vitally important that we have good relations with Castile at all times. Okay, so these advisor slots. Basically the upshot of being Portugal is I don't think we can afford any advisors to start with. If we just move along to this screen here, which is the economy, this is going to be very important to us as Portugal. Gives us a rundown of why we're gaining money, why we're losing money. But the important part is this, the balance. We ideally want this to be positive at all times. Now we've currently got 0.58 ducats. This is every month, it's what we gain. So we are just about positive. If we get any advisors at all, even the cheapest advisors cost one ducat a month. And that will put us into the negative. So, honestly, we would love to get these advisors, but I really don't think we can afford them. Okay, so other things. Basically, as Portugal, we need to be looking to eliminate expenses at every opportunity. One of our expenses is fort maintenance. Right, now there's a good reason to have this fort here. I don't think we can realistically get rid of this fort. Hmm, maybe we actually could. But this fort specifically is absolutely unnecessary. So I would recommend that we actually destroy it. In theory that would give us enough money to afford an advisor, but in practice I don't think we should. Because I just know we're going to be extremely low on money. So this is another alert that we're unfortunately going to have to ignore. This alerts truce will expire. This just tells us we currently have a truce with Granada. So we shouldn't attack them or we will get a lot of negatives. That isn't going to be a huge problem. Attacking them is more of a Castile thing than us anyway. We're more interested in Morocco, as we will see. So although in some ways they'll be easy pickings, because they're quite a bit smaller than us, it's not something that's really part of our core concerns. This section here it doesn't really interest as much as Portugal. One of the things you can do as a, a Christian nation is when you make royal marriages you get a small chance of gaining a personal union if that country loses a monarch and doesn't have an heir. So you can get countries for free. It's worth bearing in mind when we make alliances, when we make royal marriages. Realistically, yeah, I mean, we'll give it a go, we'll try. What you do is you look at this section and you look for anyone generally who has no heir and has a relatively old leader, I suppose. So on this list, you might be looking at, say, Leinster, 48 years old. Oh, Imereti, 63. Unfortunately, Imereti's nowhere near to us. So I don't think we're in with much of a chance there. But yeah, this, this alert isn't one we can deal with. It's just going to show up to warn us that there's opportunities, basically. So, so much for the alerts. We've got the, the major shield here. So we're going to need to have a check of most of these at some point. One of the most important ones to check is this one, missions. 
So this generally gives us a guide as to how Portugal is meant to be played. So this is going to be different depending on DLCs. We're currently running with none of the DLCs. So this is the, the most basic game. We have to be really careful with Portugal. The reason I say that is I don't think it's a concern on this mission tree, but on some of the DLC mission trees, there are missions that if you fulfill them, you get claims on landing Castile. As I've said, I think it is really important to Portugal that we keep Castile friendly. And having claims on their lands is going to cause friction. So really be careful about fulfilling missions. You don't have to fulfill a mission when you complete the conditions. You will get a little alert with a little flag on and you can click on it to complete it. And in some cases we might choose not to. I don't think that's the case here because I don't think it has the Castile claims in the non-DLC thing. But it's just a caution if you're playing with DLCs. Okay. So, Beyond the Cape, this is Exploration, which we're going to be able to do relatively easily, which is going to lead into our many colonisation missions. You see, colonisation is the only one that carries on down, really. So we're going to be very interested in that one. Build to Force Limit. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. We will cover that next. Trustworthy Allies, hopefully we can fulfil that. What we probably won't be able to fulfil is acquire subjects as Portugal. There's no real opportunities to do that. But certainly Castile will try and keep as a long-term ally. High income will take care of itself, amazingly. And competitive advantage... Oh, I see, grow our navy. Yeah, the thing is, a lot of these missions we're not going to worry about too much because we're a bit too worried about money. Unfortunately, it's mostly going to be this one that we follow. There are advantages to completing the missions, though. You tend to get bonuses, and it's often a good way to play, certainly when you're starting out, is to try and fulfil missions. Oh, it's going to be a little harder here than usual. So this is the military screen. The most important part of it, from our point of view, is going to these two little bits here. These basically show how many troops we have versus how many we can cope with easily and how many boats we have. Well, <laughs> not exactly boats, I think mean, thousands of boats, but yeah, how many nautical units we can have, naval units, and how many we are allowed to cope with. We must not go above these numbers if we can avoid it because it will cost us money. Especially this one, this will cost us a lot of money, and yeah, we, we need all the money we can get as Portugal. The other thing we can do on this screen is we can mothball our forts, which I would recommend simply because it will save us some money. The problem with mothballing forts is if there's an uprising, or if we're attacked without warning, then the enemy will be able to take the fort, or they will unmothball it, and then we'll have a nightmare getting it back. Whereas normally forts are quite hard to take. But we're going to have to take some risks as Portugal. Still that's improved our money even more. Again I'm still not going to go for advisors. Simply because we need to get as much money behind as possible. Colonising is expensive. And we really don't have the money. So. Okay. Those are the main bits I think. So let's check out the diplomacy screen usually you get this with a shortcut you can go there from here but I would normally just right click on a nation so if we right click on our cells we get our basic diplomacy screen which is where we've set our rivals a little bit ago this is what we can currently see we have an alliance with England and we have a truce with Granada so the first thing we should probably do, to be honest, is break our alliance with England. England is likely to get in a fight with France. Partly, oh, interesting, actually. I wonder if we could keep the alliance with England simply because Castile isn't friendly with France. So I've right clicked on Castile just to look at their 
set up, but then they're also enemies of England. So honestly, I think at this stage, the Alliance of England is something that's probably going to do us more harm than good. So if we right click on England, I'm just going to open all of these so we can see them all, because we're going to need all of them at some point. And yeah, just going to dissolve the Alliance. They won't like it and we will try to improve relations with them as time goes on but I just don't want dragging into a war okay so if we click back on ourselves so we're basically allowed up to four diplomatic relations at the moment otherwise we're going to start taking some negative penalties so the the one really important one that we're going to need if we just right click on Castile is an alliance with Castile Unfortunately, because we just broke an alliance with England, it's not allowing us to offer an alliance until a bit of time has passed. So instead, I'm going to offer them a royal marriage, which is the first step towards an alliance. Or at least will improve our chances of getting one. The vital section here, when on another country, is their opinion of us and our opinion of them. Either of these can break our alliance. We need to keep this especially as high as possible, but ideally both of them really high. We honestly, we just want to really keep Castile on board. At least until the very late game. One of our big advantages is the fact that Castile is kind of protecting us from all other powers. Certainly over European powers. We can still be attacked by ship, but generally people are unlikely to attack us. They'll go for Castile first. If we can keep Castile friendly, we should be able to avoid any military stuff. Apart from some we might initiate in Morocco and anything Castile drags into. But again, even if Castile drags into war with, say, France or England, most of the time, sure, we can send troops, but they're not going to be able to get to us. They're going to attack Castile. So, well worth keeping Castile on board. Okay, so let's just cover a few more things. We've got a lot done. Um, what have we got? Right, this bit, very important. These are monarch, monarch power. If we just open the shield again, head back to this section, which we saw with the advisor alert. Basically, we are going to gain a certain number of monarch points every month. There are three types of monarch points. We've got administrative, diplomatic, and military. These are vitally important. We want to gain as many of these every month as we can. One of the advantages of advisors is they will actually in give us monarch points. I'm so tempted by this one. <laughs> but yeah, so our, our basic monarch points, we get three per month in each category and we then get a plus based on our current ruler. Infante Pedro so this is what we're actually gaining this is what we actually have and they're very important they they're mostly used for technology but we also use them for lots of other things we can also gain monarch power through the estates but we do need to be very careful we want to keep this above 30 if we possibly can so we're currently on 34.988% Maybe worth looking at what we can do with the burgers because they have not enough power. So if we click on this down here, this gives us some privileges that we can give to them. So one that really interests me is this one. This will give us an extra diplomatic point per month, pretty much forever. However, we will lose 10 crown land, 10%, which we cannot afford to do. actually reduces the loyalty as well which you also can't afford to do right now and reduces our absolutism which is bad but you know we're not going to be that concerned so we're certainly not going to be doing this right now I don't think we can really afford to hmm possibly afford that one ah don't have enough naval tradition fair enough but these are options anyway. I mean, this especially I would like to do if we can. What I might try and do is rebalance the crown land. So if we can seize enough crown land, 
might then grant privilege to the burghers. Maybe the clergy, so that they get more relative to the nobility. But we'll see. I just feel like the nobles are extremely powerful at the moment. But it's not something we can do right now, but it is an option for gaining more monarch points if necessary. We do want this as high as we possibly can. The big thing that it will improve is technology, which we will be looking at. Okay, so what else do we have? We have a constant running total of ducats in our treasury. We want this as high as possible. It's not as important as some other things, certainly not as important as our monarch points, but as Portugal it's more important than usual because we are going to struggle, especially once we start colonising. We also have manpower, which is our available land troops. This is important for war, wanted as high as possible. It does have a maximum, unlike the money, and sailors are the equivalent for the navy. But we're not too concerned about that right now. One thing I do wonder, seeing as we do have some spare money, is whether it's worth trying to fulfill this mission, build to force limit. And possibly build to navy limit. So we can afford to build five more troops and three more ships. So let's just look at our troops. We currently have a single army. I'm not gonna get into why, but normally in the early stage of the game, we can't build guns and we generally want four cavalry and the rest to be infantry. Plus we have limited money. Now given, given that we're going to stay friendly with Castile, it probably makes sense to have our military over here. We can move them, but I'm just thinking it might be worth building five infantry just here. On the other hand, building all the infantry in one province this is a province means that it will be really slow so maybe we shouldn't so the fast way to build units and lots of other things is a production interface just over here actually goes straight to our ability to build things there are a number of options here we're not going to get into them let's just stick with this these tags we will click on it's like ships and military units All right so if we choose the basic medieval infantry and we're just going to build five so i've got one down here so that's drained most of our money so at the moment we're not going to be able to do the naval thing which is fine okay so we need to look at the navy we actually have two navies this often happens our first one isn't really a navy it's made up of light ships light ships are not really intended to fight they can fight but they're usually used for protecting trade so there are two things we do with them select a mission protect trade there are other missions if you have dlcs and at the moment there are three places we could protect trade they're actually trade nodes these will become very important for us later so this is one of them severe this is our home trade node which we share with Castile another reason why we need to stay good allies and it's the most important trade node for us however we will make a loss overall the reason we'll make a loss if we send our ships here is that the ships require maintenance so we'd be better off by the look of it if you can see what it's saying total change will be so and so profit we'd be better off sending them to Safi which I think is here so in effect, these ships are just automatically going to protect our interests on the sea against pirates, against other nations. So we're going to send them to Safi and that will make us a little more money each month. The other thing we need to ch choose when we're dealing with them, dealing with light ships, because they're not intended to fight, is if we click this, it will basically get them to go out of harm's way as soon as it can if we end up in a war which I do recommend doing, otherwise we'll lose them. And honestly, it might not seem like much, but as Portugal, those 0.11 ducats a month are worth having. Okay, so the other navy, if we can get by left-clicking again. Right, so, this actually comes with another clue as to how to play. We have three other types of ships, apart from light ships. These are transports. 
they cannot fight. So really you don't ever want them on their own. They're used purely to move our army about and they are quite important. So we've got nine of those. Galleys. <laughs> Confusingly, I would consider them to be light ships. But they're not called light ships in the game, so we're not going to call them that. We need to call them galleys. They're not going to concern us much. Because they're mostly useful for enclosed waters. Now the Mediterranean counts as an enclosed sea, so galleys are quite useful here. So they might be useful if we were going to fight a bunch of wars here. However, we're not. Most of what we'll be doing as Portugal is going to be on the high seas. So galleys, they're basically just a, a cheap, weak military ship and they're not a lot of use to us really because we're just not going to be fighting inland much. So we're mostly going to be going for these heavy ships. These are extremely expensive, both to maintain and to build, but we're definitely going to want them because naval superiority is going to be one of our advantages as Portugal. However, we're not going to want them until late in the game when we've sorted out all our money issues. So it's going to be a while before we want to build a load of these. We're probably going to be more interested in the light ships because they can make us money. But we have four of these to start with, and the fact that we don't start with galleys kind of gives us a clue that we're not meant to be building them. So, place where the game being helpful. However, this particular navy is at the moment, they're, they're going to be our main navy basically. These light ships we're probably going to ignore for more or less the rest of the game. They're just going to get on with their thing, make us money. Excellent. Okay, so we want to transfer our troops over here. So if we click on our army, one other thing that I've actually neglected is ideally you want your army to have a leader. But it's currently got no leader. We actually start with the Earl here. So we're actually just going to choose him as a leader. Now he's actually a really good leader. As a, as a general guide to how powerful an army is, you can see these little stars. Okay, we started with no stars, which means we have no leader. There's a more in-depth guide by these little pips here. You can get into like what they actually mean, but generally speaking, of all the pips are great, as we're mostly going to be going off stars. At this point in the game, most of our leaders are going to have one star when we make them, but we've been gifted this two-star leader. No guarantee on how long we'll have him, but this is another reason why this might be a time when we can actually do some military stuff down with Morocco, maybe Granada. So we definitely want to get them in place. Okay, so that's great. We have our leader, we can see that he's active. So to get him moved across, to get this army moved across, there's an option here, attached to transport. But we do need to have a navy with transport ships currently parked in the province, in Lisboa, which we do. So otherwise this would be greyed out. So we choose that, you can see it's in red now to say that we're attached. So at this point we can choose the navy, the one with actual transport ships, and we can actually literally just right click this time and we can see that they're attached it says we've got nine regiments embarked and there's no room for any more so we can just close that that is on its way it's set off we've had to leave behind five regiments I'm not sure why the general stay behind. I think that might be an artifact because he hasn't set off yet. I think he will actually go with the troops. With some of the DLCs, it's possible to tell them to move your whole army automatically. This is one of the disadvantages we have. We have to do it manually, but in some ways it does give us more control, so it's not all bad. Okay, so that's the start of our army. Oh, <laughs> So you can see we, we still have the game paused at the moment, we haven't even started the clock because we had an awful lot to do. What else do we need to think about? Not a lot at the moment, I don't think. I think we're well on our way. There are other things that we can cover over time. 
but I think in terms of what we need to do at the start of the game we probably have got it covered we could look at other alliances so yeah I suppose it, hmm, it's debatable to be honest so just right clicked on Castile again actually let's just right click on us so we've got the option of four diplomatic relations we only have one so we have room for <laughs> three more the problem is every diplomatic relation we have could drag us into a war so Castile dragging us into a war probably isn't that dangerous but someone else dragging us into a war could be risky I know it might not be too bad to be fair as long as they're not at war with Castile so what we could consider is if we right click Castile is look at who Castile is allied with at the moment they're not allied with anyone they've got a royal marriage with us we're hopefully going to ally them in fact I imagine they will ask us for an alliance I believe we're still down as historical friends you can actually see that in the reasons why they have a plus 75 opinion of us so hopefully they will ask us for an alliance and if not we will ask them for one so we have a very good relationship with Castile we don't want to ally any of their rivals or enemies which is another reason we dropped the alliance with England so yeah I suppose we'll just see how that goes as far as diplomacy goes ah yes one other thing that I have actually failed to consider yeah in fact I'm going to actually cancel my move to Kota you have to forgive me, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Suta? Koita? I really need to look it up. But yeah, sorry, apologies. I had completely forgotten our explorer, who also counts the leader. It's one of our advantages as Portugal that we begin the game with an explorer. Normally, it's quite a way into the game before you get that. So what I'm actually going to do before we start moving our ship troops across, is I'm going to split our navy into an exploration navy, and a navy that we actually use for war. To start with, the exploration navy probably just needs to be a single heavy ship. This option here is split in half. <laughs> there may be better ways to do this with DLCs, but as it is, I think we stuck with a slightly hampered approach. So this now is our exploration navy. It's actually called I think that's the name, Atlantico. And it has just changed. Oh, I see. It's a full name. Okay. I'm actually going to call it Explorer, which is terrible. It's not remotely Portuguese. But uh, it tells us what it's there to do. So again, we want to set a leader. Explorers count as a kind of military leader. Um, you get admirals and explorers. You see, we can't make a new explorer. So if this particular guy dies, we don't have an explorer anymore. So we must make the most of him. Again, as a two stars, which is surprising. It's quite impressive. Generally, the explorers won't be as good as admirals. They won't have as many stars because they're, they have an extra ability. And the extra ability is that they can sail into these terra incognita areas. So what we're gonna start off with, with our explorer, is you see we've got a mission for exploring Africa. We're actually looking for this mythical kingdom of Preston John. I say mythical, I mean arguably, I think Ethiopia is a Christian nation, so they possibly qualify. But yeah, basically, at the time, apparently Portugal thought that Africa probably didn't extend very long, and they were going to find this Christian kingdom, and they were going to use it to um, sweep all the Muslims out of Africa. And the Holy Land, which I think is here. Realistically, this isn't going to happen. Africa is far bigger than we realise. And we're about to find that out. So what we're going to start with is exploring down here. We must be extremely careful with our explorer. Because exploring damages ships. I think this here is the health of the ship. 
But to start with, we're going to send them into this cloud, Terra Incognita. You can only enter this if you have an explorer. There's also a land equivalent called a Conquistador, which can explore land, Terra Incognita. But for the time being as Portugal, we're mostly concerned with exploring. No other nation is able to do this. Obviously, each nation will have different Terra Incognita. There will be African nations, which will already know this area. But we are going to be the forerunners. It's our big advantage. So let's make the most of it. So if we can... Selecting navies and armies, you can do by just clicking on them. But if there are multiple in one spot, or even if you just prefer it, you can also click the left mouse button and hold it down and drag across to select everyone. The problem there is we've actually picked up our uh, navy, our second navy, which we don't want to do. We only want to include the navies <laughs> other than the explorer. So we'll probably do that once we have started the game proper and the explorer's got out of the way. And we will then start moving our army. I'm going to do it the same way, so I'm actually going to combine these for now. So this shows how you do it. Selected both of them. And we've got this option to merge the selected units so they all become one army. You usually do want your armies merged, simply because they'll all come under one general and, yeah, you can coordinate things. But yeah, I think that is actually everything. We're finally ready to start the game. There are other things we'll need to cover as we go along, but yeah, I think that is it. So, I hope that wasn't too boring for people. It does get better, but it's important to start the game with as many advantages as we can get and so uh, yeah you do have a lot to do before you unpause and yeah we will uh, we will actually get into it properly next time i will see you then